All right, so the plan um, today, if you're watching in sector, all right, um, is we need to um, move on fractionally and in sector, if you go forward to next turn, you'll see there is a lesson on alcohols and then followed up with that, there's another lesson um, and I'll, I'll attach the video to the right lesson. Um, there's another lesson that follows on um, that looks at aldehydes um, and ketones and then following on from that there is another lesson on carboxylic acids. Okay, what we're going to try and achieve today and hopefully we'll get there because they're all sort of um, linked together is we're going to try and get through alcohols, aldehydes, ketones and we'll see how we go. Alright, so that's the plan. Now in your book if you can refer to 254 um, the section uh, that really is the beginning of the functional groups. Before we um, start with our functional groups, uh, what you'll see is a pattern evolving with every functional group that we go through. So all the functional groups follow this same pattern as you'll see shortly. So we start off with um, we start off with the structure okay, of the compound first. So we actually draw it, we actually identify the functional group. Typically the second thing is how is it uh, produced? In other words, if we're looking at alcohols, the first thing we're going to look at after structure is how we produce alcohols, okay, how we make an alcohol. We'll talk about methods as well in that in the context of that. Um, then we look at the series of reactions. So what sort of reactions do the functional group, or I should say does the functional group undergo? Sometimes there is no reactions that you need to be familiar with. Sometimes there are several reactions that you have to be able to sort of put into your bundle of resources and apply in a whole series of questions. So that could be variable. Um, and the last thing typically is test four. And normally with each of the functional groups, uh, although we haven't looked at all of them yet, um, there is a test for the functional group. The tests are normally a chemical test, right, as we'll find. And it's either a colour change or there's bubbles given off. So typically we use that to look at every single functional group. And we just follow that pattern for all of them, all right? The same deal. Um, at the end of this, I will give you a um, series of revision sheets and that'll have all the functional groups and it will be a little bit like a concept map. So typically we will start off with say an alkene and from an alkene we make an alcohol. From an alcohol we can make an aldehyde. From an alcohol we can make an aldehyde. Did I say that? I didn't I? From the alcohol we can make a ketone, um, from the aldehyde we can make a carboxylic acid, then we can combine a carboxylic acid with the alcohol to make an ester, and it just multiplies. So you have this huge resource of functional groups and how we generate all the functional groups, typically one from the other. All right, let's look at alcohols as being the first group then. That look at. Term alcohol is a general term, so it's anything in a structure or any, any, uh, any compound, any organic molecule that's got an OH in its structure. So it's not too difficult, so we typically draw an alcohol with an OH in the structure. You can expand it out um, and we tend to look at it like that. We don't include non bonding electrons in an organic structure, right? we don't have to, um, we just basically draw it simply. There are if we look at the structure for alcohols, there are three types of alcohols that we need to be able to identify because they undergo different reactions. So the first sort of alcohol are called primary, and they have this formula. They are primary alcohols, we'll come to these again in a minute when we look at the reactions of primary alcohols, reaction of secondary and reaction of tertiary. So that That'll cover this section, all right, shortly. Number two, they are called also secondary or categorised as secondary. 
So if I have two carbon chains um, branching from the carbon that's directly bonded to the OH, then they become a secondary alcohol. And then of course, tertiary. Tertiary is where we have got three branches, three carbon chains. They've got to be carbon chains, they can't be anything else um, for it to be a tertiary alcohol. So of course the R means an alcohol group, some sort of a carbon chain. So we've got primary, secondary, tertiary alcohols. So all we're trying to do is to look at this carbon each time. And if you think that's one, one carbon chain is primary, then it's given the symbol one, zero, secondary, two, zero, and tertiary, three, zero. So I'll use that terminology eventually as well. So all that single carbon, and you can see with each one, two branches, three branches, tertiary. It comes back again um, when we do uh, the section on amines. We talk about primary amines, secondary amines, tertiary amines, and we throw in another one called a quaternary ammonium salt. But we'll cross that bridge when we need to. All right, so they are the alcohols that we need to identify. While we're there, we might as well look at the reactions. So these react slightly differently. And if you are following in your textbook, um, all we look at is the, we call it the oxidation of the alcohols. And the alcohols behave differently depending on what we are reacting it with. We typically use, we don't have to, but the oxidising agent that we use is normally dichromate. Okay, as our oxidising agent, potassium dichromate. And just trying to think, will we get a chance? We'll probably do a, a practice, will we? We might get a chance to do a practice um, fermentation and distillation, but we're going to be pretty pressed much for time for that one. So, this is orange in colour, so it's just a, a redox reaction, and this is green in colour. So, when we get the colour change from orange to green, it's a positive result, we know that something has happened in the reaction. Um, it's got to be acid catalyzed for all of these reactions. Um, and of course you can balance the half equation when you need to, it's just a redox reaction. So what happens is when I start off with um, a primary alcohol, if I allow the primary alcohol to react with dipromate under acidic conditions, I generate an actual aldehyde, there it is there. So I transfer my alcohol into an aldehyde structure. Now when we go to aldehydes, which is our next functional group, the question is how do we make an aldehyde? Oxidation of a primary alcohol. So it begins to repeat itself in all the organic stuff. If we allow it to continue to react, what we do is we end up with a carboxylic acid functional group. So when we do carboxylic acids, the first thing is, how do we produce a carboxylic acid? Oxidation of a primary alcohol. We'll talk in a minute about how we get to the aldehyde, how we stop the aldehyde, and then how we get to the carboxylic acid. We introduce two concepts, one reflux and one distillation. If we look at a secondary alcohol, if we oxidise a secondary alcohol, then we end up with ketone. And there's our structure for the ketone, if we oxidise any secondary alcohol. If we attempt a reaction uh, with a tertiary alcohol, we get no, no reaction at all. So tertiary alcohols do not undergo oxidation. Everybody got that? All right. So three things we've got to commit to memory. Primary, secondary, tertiary, and they all react slightly differently, okay, under the same conditions. Now, not only do we use this um, as a way of producing other organic functional groups, we also can use it as a test for, okay? And the test for relies on a colour change. 
So, for example, if I had a mixture of two organic compounds, and if one of the organic compounds was a primary or secondary alcohol, and the other one was a tertiary alcohol, how would you test for those? I've got two samples, they're both colourless liquids, and I don't know which one is which, because I didn't label them at the start of the experiment, because I got distracted. How would I identify them, Will? Dichromate. I do the test with dichromate. I wouldn't do it in the whole sample, I'll take out a small quantity from the original in a test tube. I would then do a test, the primary alcohol, all right? If the primary alcohol is the one that I'm testing, I would see the color change, and the color change would be from orange, obviously to green, that would be a test for the presence of a primary alcohol. Of course, we could also use that as a test for a aldehyde, couldn't we? All right. So just keep that in the back of your memory. Um, secondary alcohol, if it was a secondary alcohol and a tertiary alcohol, I could use the same test. I could take this compound here, and when I add it to the dichromate, it should go from orange to green. It's a pretty spectacular colour change. This one here, well, there is no colour change. It goes from orange, and of course, it doesn't react, so it will stay orange. So by a process of elimination, all right, I could identify these types of alcohols separate to a tertiary alcohol. So that can be one of the tests that you need to sort of remember. What would happen if I had a primary alcohol and a secondary alcohol together? How would we distinguish between those two compounds? How would we do that, Mason? Any ideas? If we add a dichromate, the primary alcohol is going to go to an aldehyde and maybe a carboxylic acid. If we add dichromate, the secondary is going to go to a ketone. But what are we going to observe? Colour change. What's the colour change going to be for both? Orange to green. So can we distinguish between that? No? So, when we get further on in the course, what we have to do is, the assumption is that we're going to end up with a ketone if I were to do that, if I had a primary and secondary alcohol and I had to separate those to identify them. If I start off with a primary alcohol, I'd end up with a carboxylic acid. If I'm doing this in a test tube, okay? And allowing the reaction to go to completion. So really what I have done is I've turned one of them into a ketone and I've turned one of them into a carboxylic acid. Now there is another test so I can actually test for carboxylic acids and what I would have to add is I would need to add sodium hydrogen carbonate or some carbonate to this compound I have to do the same test on both of them, wouldn't I? One of them would give me carbon dioxide bubbles, that would be the carboxylic acid, is how we would tackle that one. And when I added the sodium hydrogen carbonate to this, nothing happens. Ketones don't react with carbonate, acids do. Okay? So we will find that out when we look at that in carboxylic acids. We don't do a lot of ketones, okay? You only have to identify the structure for a ketone. All right, there is another test as well. We'll just introduce briefly. And if I had an aldehyde functional group, the test for an aldehyde is what we call a Tollens test, okay? And we call that a silver mirror. And while we're not up to that yet, let's go and grab my silver mirror. Um, and here is our Tollens test, all right? Did this a few years ago, just to show off, all right? So that started off with a colourless flask, okay? And when we put into that the aldehyde, we add silver nitrate, sodium hydroxide, we end up with a silver mirror. So that's a positive test, very positive test, for an aldehyde functional group, okay? So we'll do that in class, um, you'll be doing it, and you'll get an opportunity to bring in some, um, some bottles, some colourless bottles. Preferably filled with scotch would be great. And I'll empty the scotch or whatever's in there, and then you can have the empty bottle back. 
all right? And then you can make it all silver. So I'm quite okay with that. Yes? Reverse? We can't reverse that reaction. Okay, that's how they make mirrors, by the way. How they what? How we... That's it, that flask, the only way I can reuse that flask is put phosphoric acid in it, dissolve the silver, and start again, all right? So once it's coated with silver, that's why when we, when we use test tubes as a sample here, or you'll bring along bottles to use, um, basically you've got to actually dispose of it. You can't, you can't use it again, all right? Jack. Is that type of reaction actually an actual Quite. Yeah, it's used to make mirrors. We produce okay. silver from silver nitrate. Yeah, uh, but I think from what, from what I know, they actually use, use that, but they've actually used, known about that one for quite a while. Oh, oh yeah, it's been that, around for ages, yeah. They used to use that for sort of high-end cups. They used to use that for high-end cups. That's correct, yeah. All right, so that, that reaction has been around, and they used to use uh, all the, the, the actual, the aldehyde we're going to be using is going to be glucose-sucrose mixture, okay? So it works really well, and uh, but the, the trick to this procedure is you've got to have whatever you're going to coat the silver onto has to be absolutely spotless. So if you try and have a flask that hasn't been cleaned properly, it won't coat on the inside. Any amount of dirt or detergent on the inside of a flask, it won't, it won't coat. So what I say is that before you actually bring a bottle in to coat it with silver nitrate, uh, for demonstration purposes, then you need to make sure you run it through a dishwasher, soak it with sodium hydroxide overnight, and then thoroughly rinse everything off that bottle. Okay? So the sodium hydroxide will take everything off the surface of the glass. But it needs to be dry and clean before you use it. Anyway, we'll get to that point eventually. Alright, now back to primary alcohols. Um, and how do we stop it at this particular point? Because this hook this actually links up with our aldehydes as well. Now, what we need to do to stop the reaction here and having done physical properties of compounds yesterday, if we had the same carbon chain link aldehyde and the same carbon chain link carboxylic acid, which one is going to have the lower boiling point? This one, isn't it? Okay. So that it's going to have a very low boiling point. We can say it's going to be more volatile than the corresponding carboxylic acid. All right? So we, ha we actually can, because it's got a lower boiling point than this one, we can actually then distill it off as the aldehyde's being made. Now the way that we do it is this. I'll do a setup um, using a pear-shaped glass, and you'll see the picture in your book. Um, we have to have, that's my still head there, uh, we've got our condenser set up, we've got our receiver adapter set up, and what we have to do is we separate out with a separating funnel up here, up here, typically up here, we've got to have the mixture separated. And normally up here we've got a mixture of actually the dichromate um, and the alcohol up there, all right? And then down here, we've got a mixture of obviously just the acid, and then we drip this down into here. And as soon as we actually allow the oxidising agent and the ethanol to come in contact with the acid, the reaction starts. This is orange in colour because it's got dichromate dissolved in the ethanol. This immediately goes, this immediately turns into a green colour. And before we allow it to go through to here, we don't want that to happen. So before we allow it to go through to there, it will immediately condense off and in our containers down here, in our rapid test tubes, um, the first chemical we hope to get off is going to be the aldehyde. Because we don't allow it to hang around to react and produce a carboxylic acid. So what we actually say is, to produce the aldehyde, we have to distill 
as it is formed. Because if we don't do that, as I've said three times already, it's going to go through to the carboxylic acid. It's going to basically not yield aldehyde. Okay? So that process is fairly important. Now we haven't done a procedure like that yet. Okay, again, um, that's, the, that's the theory behind producing an aldehyde. If we want to jump from here, if we are only aiming to produce the carboxylic acid, it's no real issue. What we would do is this. Um, we would typically set up for this, and who can remember what that's called from last year? What's that technique called, remember? What? Reflux, yep. So we would set up for reflux. And reflux does what? What does that allow our reactants to do? Amazing. Continuously, like, Continuously allows reactants to react, hits a condenser, cools down, condenses back into the solution. So any unreacted chemicals, we're basically forcing the primary alcohol to produce an aldehyde. Any aldehyde that's made, we're forcing it to stay there, can't escape, go through to the carboxylic acid. Okay, so the idea of reflux allows us to keep everything in the same mixture without losing any reactant or any product. Never. No, it's, it's not... Well, we could call it an equilibrium, okay? But all we're trying to do is to maximise the heat. We want to use the rate of reaction. We want to make sure, though, that we don't lose the products, okay? Or we don't lose the reactants before they've had an opportunity to produce products, okay? So it's still going to... It still can produce, not in this case. This is not an equilibrium reaction, but when we look at esters, you'll find it's an equilibrium. All right. So there is a limit to how far we can push the reaction. But this one here, all we're trying to do is to turn most of the reactant okay, into the product. How do we do it? Well, the longer we've got them together, the higher the yield of product. And we've spoken briefly about yield when we did industrial chemistry. Okay. All right, so we allow that to happen. And then all we do is, from here, we simply then allow it to do its thing, and then what do you think we're going to do to get the carboxylic acid out of whatever is left in that class? How do we separate chemicals out in an organic environment? Distill. distill. Let's go and distill it. Okay. And of course, that's our diagram for distillation. All right. So we take obviously off that um, the actual the separating panel off. For a moment, it goes in. And the last step is to distill. And we would then know what the boiling point of the product is that we're trying to achieve. And we would then move our flask over and we maybe would end up with a carboxylic acid somewhere over here. All right. Why have I sort of got this sort of intermediate little sample here? That could be a mixture of both. Okay, because it's not going to be a, an obvious transition between the two. All right. So even though I am doing this, I'm going to do a reflux. Come distillation time, it's possible that I've still got some aldehyde present. That's going to have a lower boiling point, and I want to separate the aldehyde away from the carboxylic acid. Now this is further down the track, but we've spoken about it. So if I now have what I think is a carboxylic acid, how would I purify the carboxylic acid? How would I increase its purity? It's in the organic practical coming up next turn. Mason? I do another distillation just with my product, and my product only, and then I'd narrow the boiling point range right down. Okay? So knowing the boiling point of this, I would go a few degrees over, a few degrees under, and I'd capture that. Now if you want to be pedantic, then you could take that, and you could redistill that again, all right? But what happens every time you distill that? We're losing. We're losing our product. So there is a limit to how far you'd want to go with that. You want, in this case here, when we do it, okay, in the lab, 
we only ever do one distillation. Okay, in an ideal world, you would take your product and at least distill it once, at least once, okay, in order to purify your product and separate it out from anything else that still comes through. All right, any questions there? Nope, okay, now, I'm gonna get rid of all that because we've sort of done the test for, we've done this sort of all over the place, but it's all right, we've got we've done the test for, the reactions, there's only one reaction we have to worry about, the reaction with dichromate. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention, we could also use permanganate. Any strong oxidising agent will do the same thing. So we normally use dichromate because it's an orange to green, it's an easy colour change to see. If I used permanganate, this would be purple, 2MN2+, which is a sort of basically supposed to be colourless. Nine times out of ten, it's a pale brown colour. So, purple to colourless, all right, would be the observation we would see. But orange to green is the one that we do most of the time. But we could we could change the question around in an exam, just change the oxidising agent, same outcome, the same products. The only thing would be a different colour change. All right, how's it produced the structure? So we've actually done the structure. How's it produced? This is the fun stage, I think. Everybody got that? Sure. Now, who um, who knows anything about alcohol? Like you may have experimented with alcohol, um, possibly, and I'm not talking about um, any alcohol at this point. I'm t actually referring to ethanol. So. Ethanol, common name, is just alcohol, as you're aware. So the common name for that is ethanol. Just turn my family off, so always watching me. All right, so ethanol, common name for that is alcohol. And of course we associate the word alcohol, not just with functional group alcohol, but with the drink, okay? So this is the the beverages, okay, that contain um, alcohol. Anyone know how all alcohol is produced? Ethanol, fermentation, all right. So we've done a section on um, elemental and environmental, and a big section of that was, you remember biofuels? Well, it wasn't big, it was about that thick in the book, all right. But in the section on biofuels, we talked about Bioethanol. Okay, so this comes back again. What's bioethanol? It's muddy. Fermentation of sugarcane. Fermentation of sugarcane. Yeah. All right. So we basically use uh, crops. It can be sugarcane, but it can be any source of carbohydrate. Normal sugarcane, um, and we ferment the actual the sugar, the glucose in the sugarcane, to produce ethanol. The ethanol we either have, okay, normally it's a blend of petrol, 50-50, or in Australia we've got, what's, what are our fuels that have got ethanol in them? E10. E10 or E85, okay? And I think we had the discussion when we did that. So you can't run any car on E10 or E85, it's gotta be E10 or E85, and when you open the petrol cap it will say, okay, whether it can take that fuel or not. Most of the modern cars will. When I say modern ones, last 10 years, all right? All right, so we use, okay, ethanol as a fuel, but of course, a number of us um, drink it, unfortunately, including me, I just had air once. That's because alcohol is toxic. Well, let's see what it does to you, all right? Now, so, alcohol, and you've mentioned the word fermentation. So that word fermentation will come up again and again and again, and that's the reaction you're gonna to have to commit to memory. Um, and along with the reaction for photosynthesis, okay, which is sort of a reverse scenario. Anyway, so all we're doing here is we're taking glucose. We are reacting glucose in a simple uh, idea with yeast, and we end up with ethanol, plus carbon dioxide as a byproduct. And I'm just 
throwing a few things in. ETOH is the short version for ethanol. All right, the safe one. E. It's shorter. All right. If you look in your book, though, it says. In order to produce ethanol, there are three reactions, and it says hydrolysis of polysaccharides to monosaccharides. We haven't yet talked about sugars, have we? Who's doing biology? So you should be able to tell me, all right? Sugars. Jack, all right? There are different types of sugars. So what are the three types of sugars that you would have covered in biology? Mono, poly, and disaccharides. Okay, so monosaccharides, okay, disaccharides and polysaccharides. I'll put some other words next to these in a minute, all right? Now, we don't do carbohydrates until a few weeks down the track, all right? Probably we should have done them before we did this, all right? But those who have done biology, good move to, to do the two subjects together. All right, so these are called simple sugars. Okay, because they've only got one glucose structure, one glucose unit in it. And that's what you need to be aware of at this particular point. So an example of that is glucose. So just normal sugar, the stuff that we're adding you know, to our coffee or tea or the 12 or 13, 15 teaspoons in a can of Coke, all right? That is just straight glucose. Um, a disaccharide is called a double sugar. Now, a double sugar has got two glucose units bonded together. An example of that is sucrose and we find disaccharides in things like honey. Okay? This one here, poly, means many. This one here has got many sugar or many glucose units in its structure. Okay? And these typically are found in starch okay or those types of foods and they are simply for example starch so things like pasta okay have got within them polysaccharides complex sugars we call them because they take a little while to break down right there they'd be the high low gi high gi what is it low low gi so these are the ones that release energy over a long period of time if you exercise if you don't exercise, it does this. Well, I'm trying to get rid of it, all right? All right, so polysaccharides, starch, complex sugar. So they're the three types of sugars that we need to be aware of, okay, at this particular point. Now, I wanted to highlight the following, and I'm just gonna copy the equations straight from the book, because we're gonna use those to explain the process of fermentation and the thing I'm going to start from. So the first one says C6H10O5, so C6H10O5 bracket N plus NH2O, and they call this hydrolysis of a polysaccharide. So this is a poly, say C, I think it's got a H in this one, polysaccharide. So this is your complex sugar. Okay, complex sugar. And if we're starting at this point in fermentation, C6, H12, these are equations you have to remember by the way. I've done my exam, so I don't do it again. Uh, second equation is C12, H22, O11, and that reacts with water. And that produces glucose. Because there's my simple sugar. And then the simple sugar, here it is, C6H12O6, um, with some yeast. Okay, goes to 2C2H5OH plus carbon dioxide as the byproduct. All right, now, I'm just gonna turn this on again. If it's going to speak. If you can open up your laptops. Um, I've got some wonderful pictures um, in 
in your um, the lesson for the alcohols. So if you go forward to next term in sector, um, and I'll bring those pictures up behind me. So, sort of, but the problem is the program that we had that you're attached to this subject was based on a 10 week term three. We've actually got an eight week term three. So we're not really ahead, of the, we're just probably where we should be all right, right now. All right, now if you look at this reaction, okay, that I've put up on the board, okay, up here, and I, I can't show you obviously on the video, all right, but um, this is not, this process of fermentation is a very complex series of reactions, okay. The first two reactions, we call those hydrolysis. This is hydrolysis of a polysaccharide. This is hydrolysis of a di Saccharides. So the first two reactions we call those simply hydrolysis because the reaction with water is hydrolysis. Um, the third reaction, this step here, and it looks like a one step process. When you look at the, the actual reactions that are occurring, just starting from glucose, glucose okay, goes all the way through a series of steps, okay, and there is more down the bottom, okay, and as you can see, that's yeast, okay? So the, those yeasts go to work and they've got to actually turn the glucose, okay, into ethanol and carbon dioxide, all right? A few things to note about fermentation. First thing is that it has to be less than 37 degrees Celsius. It is an exothermic reaction, by the way, all right? So it does get warm during fermentation. If you've ever fermented before, well, not that you've fermented, but if you've fermented, okay, sugar, um, or if you've taken, um, say, something like, say, wort, and produced beer, which is what I do, then when you start off the fermentation process, typically the container is around about 24 to 25 degrees, but then it can go up in temperature. So during summertime, I've actually got to put a cold towel around my beer fermentation, to avoid the temperature increasing. Because the temperature exceeds that, what happens? It denatures the, the yeast. And we haven't talked about denaturation of proteins yet, but if we actually allow it to get too hot, it'll kill the yeast, okay? So it's a bad thing. We don't want that to happen. Otherwise, all we end up drinking at the end of it is sugary water, okay? So we don't get the alcohol that we were trying to produce from that reaction. All right, now, so that process of fermentation is, okay, very important in those reactions. You can only get maximum about 14% alcohol under most instances, most normal fermentation reactions. Does anybody know why that's the case? Why can't we go any more than that? Why can't we take all of the glucose 100% into ethanol? Because, no, here's my reaction, here's my product. I'm not taking the alcohol out. I'm losing reactant, yes. But I've always got an excess of sugar. Significant excess. Okay, here's the second thing that's not obvious, all right? In that the alcohol, all right, is destroyed, not the alcohol, sorry, the yeast is destroyed by the alcohol. It doesn't like that alcohol environment. So it will only go up to about 14% and then the alcohol will actually kill the yeast off anyway. All right, so there is a limit to the concentration of alcohol that you can produce through a primary fermentation. Primary fermentation, okay? Primary means the first step in a fermentation reaction. So then how do we get things like um, the spirits that you're gonna bring me, um, so we, when we do our silver mirror? So how do we get spirits that are like, you know, 70% alcohol? How does that happen? It's they distill it. They've got to distill it, all right? So we have to take the alcohol that we produce from a primary fermentation, we then have to distill it, we separate the alcohol off at higher concentration, all right? So we, obviously the more we distill, the higher the concentration of alcohol becomes. That's how we produce that. Now back to this though, polysaccharide, disaccharide, and sugar. 
if I am producing a compound, compound, if I'm producing something like beer, beer starts typically off with either wheat or a barley base, okay? And that undergoes fermentation over time. This wheat or barley is a form of starch. So it's a complex carbohydrate. So if I was gonna ferment wheat or barley into a product called beer, all right, it actually starts in here in the fermentation process. So I'm starting with a complex carbohydrate. If I'm gonna produce something called mead, for those of you who aren't educated with alcohol yet, all right, mead, the starting material for mead is honey. I need a source of honey and I ferment the honey. Honey is a disaccharide, here is a disaccharide. So if I was going to ferment honey, I'm not starting from a complex carbohydrate, I'm starting from a double sugar, or a disaccharide, it picks up from this point in the fermentation process. Hydrolyze the disaccharide first, okay, and then it's the glucose that then takes over to produce the ethanol in that final section. If I'm just going to produce, okay, just if I want to produce alcohol. Typically what we can start off with is a mixture of sugar and water. Okay? And all I need to do is to add yeast to sugar and water and that will produce alcohol right, as a product. Now, this in some instances is called, um, it's called grappa, depends on your your background, all right? Some of your grandparents might still make it. Of course, it's not actually legal, all right? The maximum you're allowed to distill in Australia um, is five litres at any one time. Five, might be 10. I think it's 10 litres, all right? And you can only do that uh, for your own personal consumption, all right? Now, if you're distilling any more than that, unfortunately, if you go to a lot of the websites, the material that you buy, um, to carry out distillation is a 20 litre distill, and that's illegal, right? So you shouldn't be distilling 20 litre quantities. I did explore it at one point, I thought I might go in, you know, produce spirits, but then I worked out, no, nah, not really. There's a lot of laws associated with that stuff, so once you start distilling, you've got to be very careful, all right, about what you're doing with the products of that distillation. Anyway, so basically what you would be producing is alcohol, and then you distill off the alcohol, to produce the, you know, the, grapple, the very pure stuff. Um, but most of the time though, um, depending on your culture, what most people do um, is they start off with white wine, which has already got alcohol in it, it's already been fermented, and all they do is distill off the alcohol. All right? Very dangerous though, as you may or may not have heard a few years ago, it might be last year. Um, whenever you're doing a distillation of alcohol, there is a danger that there could be a side reaction and sometimes methanol is produced. Okay? And so whenever people are distilling, if you are doing it properly, if you had a very good chemistry teacher, and some of these guys that kill themselves don't, um, is that you have to discard the first 50 to 100 mils of the products that you're distilling. Okay? To discard any methanol. If you look up methanol, one mouthful of methanol, okay, within seconds it starts to destroy the central nervous system, and then it works on the liver, and then it works its way on the kidneys and everything. It's not rever and it's irreversible. You, you can't go, like, go to a hospital and say, oh, I've had a glass of methanol. Can you unmethanol me? Can you fix me up? Because once the damage is done, it's done. All right, you're dead. Um, and unfortunately, you'll see it, no doubt, Every year somebody does a distillation in their home, backyard or somewhere, and somebody all right, shares their product with a friend and they both end up dead. All right? So it's a very dangerous thing to start experimenting with, which is distillation. So I stick to beer, pretty safe. All right, now, so that's the process. I did hope to get a little bit further, but I'm gonna stop the, with the alcohols, all right? Any questions in relation to, to stuff we've done today? There's a lot in there, all right? It's a real lot of information, Dave. Is there a question? Sorry? Is there a question? 
less than. Oh yes, yeah. Is what? Oh, for the primary fermentation, yes. The secondary fermentation that depends. Secondary fermentation is where um, you take your product. I'll give you an example because I make beer, so I know how that works. So you would do a primary fermentation, and you normally do that on a large volume in a big container. Then, once you do the primary fermentation, you need to stop the fermentation. Well, it stops automatically because it doesn't produce any more carbon dioxide, right? So you take your product off, all right, and then with the product, you add a small quantity of sugar, and then that carries out a secondary fermentation. And I use the word without thinking about it because I do it all the time. But a secondary fermentation is where I've got alcohol and I've got maybe a slight quantity of sugar left over. Well, actually, I haven't. I've got alcohol with some yeast active in it. And so I take the alcohol off, I put it into a bottle. Okay, I cap the bottle and I'm using the process of secondary fermentation to produce carbon dioxide. And what do I, what do I want the carbon dioxide? What do I want carbon dioxide to produce in the secondary fermentation? Carbonate the drink, all right? So that's how it's done, you know, from that perspective. There's two ways of carbonation. One is to do a secondary fermentation, which means I add, well, I take my product from the primary fermentation, I'll put it into a bottle, I add sugar and I cap it. The assumption is not all the yeast has died, okay? Um, and some of that yeast will react to produce carbon dioxide to carbonate the beer. All right, that's the process. Now, if there's no yeast, no secondary okay, fermentation will occur. You've got to have some yeast that carries over, but you have to reprime it. When I say prime, I have to add some sugar. I actually use honey to prime it, so I use honey to produce the carbon dioxide in the secondary fermentation. Yeah. Not that you would, sorry? Yeah, no, don't add any more yeast, because if I did add yeast, there's a potential that the bottles would explode. Correct? Because I don't want it to ferment too much. So the amount of sugar that we do add in a secondary fermentation, that I'm teaching about how to make beer, but um, the secondary fermentation, you need to minimise the quantity of sugar because if you add too much, you produce too much carbon dioxide and things begin to explode. Well, Yeah, there is. Uh, if you've ever had parents who've had Cooper's beer, Cooper's is, they say it's brewed in the bottle. It's actually, it's bottled from a normal primary fermentation. If you look at the bottom, it's got yeast in the bottom. And that, that's the dead yeast after the secondary fermentation that happened in the bottle. Yeah, of course you can. It's, it's fine for you, all right? It's good for you. you can actually, you can harvest that yeast, by the way. Yeah, you can actually take the yeast out. You can actually then add it to water, add some sugar, you can have a go at it, all right? Um, and it will start to bubble, it will start to re-ferment again. All right? So you can, you can collect that yeast in the bottom of keeper's bottles, and I've heard of people that actually do that. I'm not one of them. Okay, and what am I supposed to say? And may the puree table be with you. <laughs>